not only are all of you here, but and some of you, many of you here for Spiritual New Week, but online, we'd like to welcome all of you as well. And I know many of you have signed up for the online experience of Spiritual New Week. Please join me in absorbing these words from Whispers from Eternity from Paramahansa Yogananda. (laughs) Through long, winding pathways of self-doubt, fording mighty rivers that separated thee from me, trudging over endless wastes of barren lives, tossing dangerously on the rapids of many ambitions, arduously climbing steep mountain trails of desire, and carefully extricating myself from whirlpools of alternating sadness and hilarity. At last I have reached my journey's end. I look upon all those past travails with joy. Every struggle, every past agony has produced a flowing spring of joyous, grateful tears. In the sacred waters of those tears, I baptize myself daily with deep love for thee. And so we'll end our talk with that. (laughs) This topic of eternal now has many facets to it. And I'm going to veer it off in a certain direction. And that's tuning into some of the emphases that Patanjali writes about in the Yoga Sutras. And they relate to this focus of the eternal now. In the sutras, Patanjali is specifically relating to it as samadhi, which, of course, is what the eternal now is signifying, is reflecting, is expressing for us. And I want to just cover some things that allow us to be more real in the eternal now, because it can remain a little bit aloof and uh, interesting, but out there as something relating to us. But let's try to see if we can envelop ourselves in that experience more and more. And one of the first things that Patanjali talks about in terms of the eternal now is Shraddha. Shraddha has all the Sanskrit names have various meanings to them, but the primary one for Shraddha, besides being one of our wonderful devotees at the village, (laughs) um, is usually understood as faith. And faith, there's a whole Sunday service reading talking about faith and the difference between faith and belief. But faith is that experience. Belief is that affirmation or hypothesis. Um, And one of the ways that we can bring faith, again, more as an integrated experience rather than just as a concept or an idea, is to first tune into the blessings that we receive, whether they're grand blessings or small blessings, but giving focus to the things that happen in our lives, blessings. Not only the blessings that we think are good, um, but the blessings that come from the difficulties, the challenges as well. Because as we tune into being in that experience of what's going on as blessings, it's very natural for us to develop gratitude. Because we start to see the gifts, the bounty of those blessings. And it naturally allows us to be grateful for those gifts, but for life itself. That gratitude starts to seep into our awareness, our consciousness, as a normal, as a natural, as a baseline of living moment to moment. So we have it integrated, not as something that's outside of ourselves. And naturally, what happens as we open to gratitude, we start to refine that experience, and it ripens into devotion. You know, a number of weeks ago in one of our Sunday services, our light bearing minister, Aaron, spoke about a story from this wonderful book called The Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. And I want to relate another story 
from that book. Uh, the story behind it is that Corey and her sister Betsy and their father uh, had a hiding place for Jews in World War II in the Netherlands. And somebody um, told the authorities about this and they were uh, brought to concentration camps in, in punishment. And they were very spiritual. Uh, they really lived a life that was full of spirit. And at one point, um, Betsy had said to Corey that everything is a gift from God. And Corey said, I agree with you except for the fleas in the barracks. If you've been around fleas, you know it's tormenting as an experience. And Betsy said, no, even the fleas are from God. And they had smuggled in a Bible and secretively would hold Bible study meetings in the barracks with a group of women, prisoners. And at one point, as they were having this study group, they heard the steps of the guards, the German guards. And they thought, oh no, because they would be brutally tortured if they were found in this study group. And then they heard one of the German guards say, oh, let's not go in there, there's fleas in there. And Corey understood, of course, the fleas were a gift from God. And as we explore and open up to that, sure, we always have to have affirmation. We have to enter into the portal, the door of those deeper experiences. But as the blessings, we acknowledge them, we tune into them, they develop into gratitude, and the gratitude ripens into devotion, then our life is oriented from devotion. And what happens as we orient our lives with devotion, then faith is the surety of our life's experience. Faith is the reality of who we are in that divine experience. And it's rich, it's fulfilling, and allows us to deal with the challenges, the fleas in our lives, in the way that we just don't tolerate them, what we boundlessly feel the expansion of joy in our lives. That faith becomes a cornerstone through our devotion, through our gratitude, through those blessings, to be very real, to be in that eternal now in each moment. The next point that Patanjali offers us to apply in our lives is virya. And again, besides being a wonderful devotee here at Ananda Village, <laughs> um, virya can mean a number of things. As I said, both, uh, I said this for Shraddha, but virya means strength. It means having dedication. And Swami Kriyananda, in his commentaries on the Yoga Sutras, added a very important focus for us on this path, the development of focus willpower. Because with that, we engage in an energy that allows the power of strength to be there with us. Because we know from the energization exercises, and maybe there's a few of you that aren't familiar with them, but they're one of the cornerstones of what Paramahansa Yogananda brought in terms of our experience of the divine. And granted, what we feel a lot of, especially as we learn them in the beginning, we're feeling the power of the exercise recharging ourselves with cosmic energy. In fact, we have the prayer, O oh, infinite spirit, recharge my body with thy cosmic energy. So we know that, we can feel that, it becomes more and more reality. But the other side, or one of the many facets, I would say, there are many sides to the energization exercises, is this attunement to developing the muscle of willpower, of will. Or sometimes it's, it, we can tune into it as the power of willingness, but the strength of that 
is very, very key for our spiritual growth. Because if we're lackadaisical on the spiritual path, it's as if we've got a, a letting go of what's needed. Because what's needed is 100% of our commitment. And through the energization science, we have a tool that becomes immediately, not down the road, but immediately practical in terms of giving us not the strength of the muscles of our body, the strength of knowing that we have that infinite cosmic energy at our behest. But it isn't just about willpower that gives us strength, that gives us virya. If we think about it in terms of virya being dedication, and this is what Yogananda emphasized in doing the energization exercises, is that it is that will, that willpower with awareness. It isn't just thrusting ourselves into the intensity of the outward experience. It's allowing awareness to be in that flow of that experience from the get-go. And indeed, one of the phrases that most of us know, if not all of us know, of how to do the energy exercise, it's, it's a key one, it seems so simple, but it's key. Tense with will, relax and feel. That feeling allows us to bring the awareness to a heightened level of that experience. And when we feel that behind the emphasis of dedication, that we are dedicated to moving forward spiritually, no matter what happens, no matter if the world in your private corner of it collapses. And it probably feels like it does collapse, right? I mean, just think about the concept of the eternal now. Sometimes what we may experience is the eternal drag. <laughs> and it seems like, wait a minute, do I have to do this forever? Um, but when we signed on to be incarnated, we signed on forever. But we don't have to sign on forever under the conditions of maya, of duality. Duality, maya, is going to continue with you or without you. You don't have to worry about maya. <laughs> you do have to focus on that maya can engage in the battle without you even understanding that it's happening. And so what we want to do is not so much worry about that part of it. We want to respect maya for being a powerful force of delusion. But what we really want to do is engage in where we're going with our dedication, our energy, our awareness. And when we do that, we have won the battle in this moment, in that eternal now. You know, um, there's a wonderful phrase that uh, we put out on a t-shirt um, back in 2012, uh, when we were dealing with some challenges at that time, as a whole for Ananda. And it said, Yata Dharma Stata Jaya. And we say the phrase a lot, mainly in English, um, but in English it can be understood as this, where there is Dharma, where there is adherence and application of right attitude and right action, then there is victory. Jaya is victory. So it's not something we are entertaining, but engaging and merging into. That where there is dharma, where there is that dedication, whatever trials come to dharma, of really upholding the highest level of God's dynamic presence, then we ensure our victory in that moment. We may have to do steps to ensure that victory in its outer expression, but we personally have that victory in that moment, in that eternal now. Then the third thing that Patanjali emphasizes is Shmriti. Now Shmriti means different things in different parts of the Yoga Sutras. Um, in this case, Shmriti re re recalls the emphasis of being mindful, being aware. Shmiti, as a general concept, is about memory. 
And in this emphasis, it's the memory of being there in the moment. It's engaging in life. It's not doing it vicariously. You know, the word vicarious doesn't get used a lot in our vocabulary anymore. Um, but for instance, uh, I just remembered this thing that I've probably said a hundred times, so you probably have heard it. But uh, I remember uh, hearing uh, the show on National Public Radio called Science Friday, which was a really, really good show on science. Um, and they were interviewing this um, research scientist uh, that they're dealing with the senses. And in this case, they're dealing with the sense of taste. And he said this remarkable statement. I, I didn't catch it from the beginning, but he said this remarkable statement that was verified by this study that they just completed. He said, by the, the second or third time that you either like eating something or dislike eating something, it's entirely by memory. It's so strong uh, a rut in your brain that you're recalling it from memory, which means you're, this word that I said, you're living vicariously. And what that means is you're living in association with it, not directly experiencing it. Pretty mind blowing, you know? That's what we call sleepwalking through life. <laughs> and we've done our bit, believe me, of doing sleepwalking through life. Maybe not this lifetime, but some previous lifetimes. But we want to get into that experience of being mindful. We want to feel that we're alert and focused. Nice words to use. I mean, if you really want to tune to alertness, alert, one of the affirmations in the Affirmation of Staff Healing book is on alertness. And it's a, I can't remember it now, but it's a nice one to tune into to arrive at that integration of being mindful because you want to have the energy in that dynamic way, not in a lackadaisical kind of, yeah, it's okay, I'm, I'm kind of tuned in. No, you want to be tuned in. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a good experience for all of us to take this week. So Nayaswami Jyotish, um, not only would Devi do a lot of things, um, but Jyotish paints. And his latest painting, which was included in his recent blog um, that came out just a few days ago, he put in Om. I think it's 11 times in the painting. It's a painting of a beautiful wave that's about to crash. Go ahead and find that blog and see if you can tune into the ohms. See if you can be mindful, alert, and focused and be absorbed in ohm coming through those waves to your own life. Well, it's a good simile for us really want to open up to the ohms in our life through the waves of blessings that come to us. And that's the idea of being mindful that we're able to be there in the moment. We're able to tune in. We're able to get past just the, uh, the flagrant outer part of life. Maybe that's not a good word, flagrant, but it seems to be okay. Um, <laughs> into the refinement of our own inner opening through life. Life is given to us to expand and multiply the gifts that God has given to us. That's Shmriti at this deepest mindful approach. And then the fourth part that Patanjali emphasizes in being the eternal now is Viveka, discernment or discrimination. The idea that we want to find truth in every moment. We want to find not the duality of my expression of truth or not, that will be there. We'll have to play with that for sure. But the idea of Vivek of discernment is to cut through all the elements of duality and be there in that experience of oneness. Because when we're able to discern, we're able to tune into that intuitive awareness of God's experience in everything. And then what happens is that we have that, which you could call jnana yoga in a way, that intuitive wisdom 
and connection and integration. With that, along with, remember I said with um, Shraddha, that the, the blessings that we tune into, they lead us into gratitude. That gratitude expands and is refined, is ripened into devotion. And that leads us to the experience of faith. So we have this intuitive wisdom in our lives. We have this devotion in our lives. And then Patanjali goes on to say, we must have keen and pointed concentration. Keen and pointed concentration. And this is what we do when we're acting with seva, with selfless service. We bring that keen concentration, that focus of concentration, that one-pointedness. One-pointedness is actually the word translated from Sanskrit. That keen and one-pointed experience of when we're living, when we're walking our lives, when we're engaging in our lives, when we're in the outer part of expression of our lives, we're selflessly involved in the experience of drawing God's presence in the eternal now. So this week of Spiritual New Week is going to focus on the battlefield and how we live our lives on that battlefield. Hopefully I haven't stolen anything from any other speakers coming this week. <laughs> but let's at least open the floodgates in this beginning part of Spiritual New Week and live in that eternal now. Listen, be in it, integrate, enjoy, and find that God is ever more deeply your companion, and more deeply than that, your one true reality. Blessings to you. Feeds the birds of the air. He who floods the hills with sunshine. He whose love all creatures share. Will he not clothe us? Will he not feed us? Are we not like them his own?